Hey guys, so I built my NAS a few months ago at this point and it's been running well, but I decided that I wanted to destroy the pool and recreate it because I wanted to change my VDEV layout. So I'm using TrueNAS Scale, which is now TrueNAS Community Edition. And I decided that if I was gonna do that and I was gonna go through this whole process, it made sense to create a beginner's guide on TrueNAS and just how it works and how you can implement it in your setup. So in this video, that's exactly what we are gonna do. I don't wanna waste much time, so we are gonna jump right into it. So like I said earlier, this is now TrueNAS Community Edition, and I'm running the release candidate version of this. Wouldn't necessarily recommend that you do that, but I didn't wanna create a video that would be out of date in a few weeks. So I updated to this. I made a few minor changes. I created a bond network, stuff like that. But in general, this is a very basic generic setup at this point, and we're gonna go through the whole process of configuring this system. So the very first thing that you have to do is you have to create a pool. So we're gonna go through and create this pool, but the important thing that I wanna highlight here is that this is the most misunderstood portion of ZFS, in my opinion. The reason is because a lot of people compare it to traditional RAID, and it is comparable to traditional RAID, when you take things like redundancy into perspective. So when I say that, I mean, you'll compare RAID 5 to RAID Z1 and RAID 6 to RAID Z2. And while that is technically a valid comparison, it's not a valid comparison for everything in specific performance. So what ends up happening is people will set up a ZFS pool and then they start to use it and they realize that the performance is terrible. And it's terrible because of how they configured the layout. So we'll get to that when we get to the layout portion. But for now, I just named it ZPool. I am gonna turn on encryption. So the important thing to understand with encryption is that you're not actually encrypting the pool. What you're doing is you're encrypting the root data set. And every single data set you create underneath that will inherit that encryption. So again, you don't have to configure this. You can leave encryption off and then you can individually encrypt whatever data sets you'd like to. But I'm gonna turn it on and then we are going to move on to the layout. Now, this is what I mentioned earlier. This is, in my opinion, the most misunderstood topic. So what you'll see here is that we have a lot of different options. But why this gets confusing is because a lot of people, especially beginners, will start to implement RAID Z1 and they'll say, I have four drives and I'm just gonna use a RAID Z1 pool. And that might make sense. That might be what you want to do. But the thing with ZFS is that you can stripe multiple VDEVs. So when you create a pool, you're creating a VDEV. If you had a RAID Z1 VDEV, that VDEV can consist of four drives. Or you can have two mirrors that consist of two drives each, and then they will be striped together. So this will drastically impact the performance. So if you are just using RAID Z1 or RAID Z2 or even RAID Z3, the read-write performance is not going to be that good. And it's because of the parity calculations. So what ends up happening is a lot of people will set up a VDEV and then they won't be happy with the performance. And they'll start looking into things like L2 ARC and a ZFS log and stuff like that to improve performance. And realistically, what they should have done is they just should have used a different layout. So this is very, very important. For me, what I have in this NAS is I have six 12 terabyte drives. So what I can do is I can create three mirrored pairs. I can create two RAID Z1 pairs, which would be three disks each, or I can use one large RAID Z1 or RAID Z2 pool. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use RAID Z1, and this will give me a happy medium between performance. It'll be better than if it was just one large VDEV, but it'll also give me more usable storage space than if I used mirrors. So I selected RAID Z1. I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna select the drive size. We'll treat it as a minimum, which is fine. And then the width, this is what's important here. So I wanna create two different VDEVs. I want the width of each VDEV to be three total disks. So that's why I selected three. And then I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna create two different VDEVs. So on the right hand side here, what you could see is that we are using two RAID Z1 VDEVs that are three drives each. Now, if performance is the only thing that's important to you, you're probably better off using mirrors, but just remember that half of your total 
drives will be used for redundancy. So we're gonna proceed here. And now again, we're going over a beginner setup here. I would say that you don't really touch any of this. So logs can potentially improve write performance. We're not gonna do that. If you have a spare drive, you could use that, but I don't. Cache drives are L2 ARC. So you don't really wanna use L2 ARC unless you maximize your RAM. If you've maximized your RAM, and you're still not happy with the performance, then you could get into L2 Arc, but we're gonna skip that for now. Metadata, you can skip over. Dedupe, you can skip over. We are gonna review this and we are gonna create the pool. All data on the disks will be erased, that is fine. And as soon as the pool is created, this is the encryption key we talked about earlier. So you do not want to lose this encryption key. If you lose the encryption key, you will not be able to decrypt this pool if you ever have to. So download this and keep it somewhere safe, somewhere not on this NAS. Once that's done, you can select done and there you go. So now our pool has been created. So at this point, we can move on to creating data sets. But before we do that, we're gonna create just a regular user account. So inside of the credentials section here, we're gonna to go to users and then we are going to add a user. We'll give the user a username and a password. And then in the group section here, I'm going to uncheck this create new primary group. And I'm just gonna add this user to the built-in users group. And this will get more important later on in this tutorial when we start looking at ACLs and stuff like that. But everything else here for me is fine. So I'm gonna create this user. Okay, so now that the user is created, if you wanted to, you could go through and create a group as well. And what that would allow you to do is if you had multiple users, you could then manage permissions on those groups rather than managing permissions on the users. But for me, this is really just me, so I don't have to really do that. But if you wanted to, you could do that. So now that that's out of the way, we are going to look at creating our first data set. So like I had mentioned earlier, the Z pool is the root data set. So when we set up encryption, we set up encryption on that root data set. So every single time you create another data set, you're creating a data set underneath that root data set. Now, why that's important is because you can create nested data sets. And the reason you'd create nested data sets is so that you can configure different snapshot schedules or backup policies, stuff like that. Same thing with permissions, that's a big one. So if you didn't wanna do that, then it starts to get into really how you wanna manage it. Should you just create one data set? Do you wanna create those nested data sets? So that's up to you. So we're gonna go through and I'm gonna create a new data set here. And I'm just gonna create it and name it media. So this is where I'll store all of my media. Now, the important thing here is the data set preset. So what you'll see here is a few options. Generic is the default Unix permissions, but SMB, apps, and multi-protocol is most likely what you're gonna use, especially if you're accessing this data set through SMB. So when you change to SMB, what it does is it uses the advanced ACLs at that point. So if you're planning on using this data set and accessing it through SMB, you should use the data set preset SMB. And that's exactly where you can create the SMB share as well. Now, if you select apps, this is what you'll use for application data. And we will look at this later. Uh, Multi-protocol, this is if you wanted to create a data set for an NFS share and SMB. This is just an easy way to do that. For now, we're just gonna stick to SMB, but you should know there are a bunch of advanced options here if you wanted to customize anything, a lot of advanced options. But we're gonna save this, and then our first data set is created. Now, like I said, just to show you, if you wanted to create a nested data set, what you do is select the data set and then add a data set, and you'd see the path. So for now, this is all that we're gonna create. We have our first share, and at that point, it is configured. But what you'll see here is you'll see these permissions here. So let's edit the permissions. Now, remember, I added my user account to the built-in users, and then at that point, technically, if I pull up a window and log into that user account that I created, I should see this. So let's quickly do that. Okay, there you go. So I just logged in and I authenticated with that Frank user account that I created. And what you'll see is we have our data set here and it is accessible. So if I wanted to, I could come in here, I could create a folder and everything works as expected. Now, why does it work as expected? It works that way because my user account was part of this built-in users group. 
If it was not part of that built-in users group, I would not have access to this. So what you'll see is the owner of this data set is the root user and the root group. But inside of the ACL itself, we have the group here. So if you wanted to, if you had a different group that you were managing, you could come in here, assign permission to that group, determine exactly what permissions it would have, and then you could manage permissions this way. The same thing is true if you want to give full control to a group, you could give full control. And then you generally apply permissions recursively so that it applies to all the folders inside of there. I'm not gonna do that. For me, modify permissions is fine. But that is officially how we created our first data set. So our first data set is created. We can access that data set with our user account and you can see how you can modify the permissions to that data set if you needed to. So now that our data set is created, what we can do is we can come into this data protection section. This is gonna be the most important section to configure once and probably not really come back to very often, but everybody needs to configure this. So the first thing you're gonna see is this scrub task. Now this scrub task is created by default. If we edit this, what you'll see is that this schedule is set to run every week on Sundays. However, the threshold is 35 days. So what that means is every single Sunday, it will check to see if this should run. If the threshold has been met, it will run. If the threshold has not been met, it will not run. So quite honestly, I think that this is perfect. I wouldn't modify this. If you wanna run it more frequently or less frequently, you can. But for me, the default is fine. A scrub task will basically go through and it will validate the integrity of the data. So this is a great feature of ZFS. This is something that should always be set up and running. But for most people, the default is probably going to be fine. Next thing we'll look at is snapshots. So snapshots freeze data at a point in time. So if you accidentally deleted data or it was corrupted or something like that, you could restore from a prior version of the snapshot. So snapshots I have always looked at as a first line of defense. So every time I've ever had to restore a file, the very first thing I check is my snapshots. Snapshot exists, I restore the file from there, and then at that point, I don't have to go to my backups or anything like that. What I like about TrueNAS is that you can set up snapshots on the entire pool. And then if you wanted to, you could go in and exclude a specific data set. But generally, I set this once and I very rarely change it. I'll normally set this to four weeks for the total uh, snapshot lifetime. Now, the one important thing that you have to do, in my opinion, is set it to recursive if you're doing it at the highest level like I am here. And what this does is this will take an individual snapshot of each data set, meaning every child data set, and they'll be individual rather than creating an entire snapshot of the entire pool. If you see that and it's something that you don't want to do, you can keep this disabled. But for me, I normally keep that enabled. Everything else here is fine. If you want to change the time, you can. Naming scheme, same. We're going to save this. And at that point, our snapshot schedule has been created. Now, moving down here, we're going to create smart tests. So smart tests will check the integrity of your hard disks. So I normally set up two. I'll set up a uh, long test to run on a quarterly basis. I'll set up a short test to run on a weekly basis. You can change the frequency if you'd like. I just come in here, select all disks. We are going to change this to long. We are going to modify the schedule. And what I normally do is I'll set this to run on Saturdays, and then I will do quarterly, and I'm gonna do the second of the month. And I always do the second of the month because if you don't do that, what ends up happening is when you create your short test, you're possibly gonna run into an error, and it's just based on the days that this is running. So once that's done, I'm gonna select done here, and then this is going to be my long smart test. We are gonna save that. So that will run every quarter on the second day of the month. I create another one do for all disks, and then I will run a short test and I'll run this weekly. And normally Sundays at midnight is fine. We're gonna save that. And then at that point, our smart tests have been configured. So for a default setup, this is a great starting point, but there are things you're probably gonna to wanna to do. 
So true cloud backup tasks, we're not gonna go over this. I might do this in another video. If there's any interest, you could leave a comment. But what this allows you to do is it allows you to back up directly to a cloud storage location. It's store J, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but this is a true cloud backup and it is generally pretty easy to set up here. So you can go through and just make sure that you have some sort of a backup. So this is one backup task you could run. A second would be a cloud sync task. Now a sync is not a backup, but if you set up a sync and you have snapshots on whatever the destination storage is, then it's kind of a backup. But because of the way TrueNAS handles their backup, this is a very common option for a lot of people here. So I'd recommend setting this up if you don't want to use StoreJ, if I'm saying that right, and you want to use a different cloud storage location, just make sure if you can that the destination location has some sort of snapshot feature so that, God forbid, you were hit with like a ransomware attack or something, you'd have some sort of a recovery path. Next would be an rsync task. So if you have a local server set up, it's not a bad idea to set up an rsync task. This will allow you to back up the TrueNAS data to a local NAS or even a remote NAS using rsync. This is a very powerful feature. So I might do a backups video again, but that's something that everybody should set up. Okay, so now that we went through all of that, we're gonna take a look at applications. And I like to start here with applications because I like to create an applications data set and store the data for my applications in that data set. So what I normally do is I come in here and I create a data set and I call it apps. And the important thing here is that you set the preset as apps. This will grant all the permissions that you need to without really doing anything else. So we're gonna save this. And then after that data set is created, I'll normally create nested data sets for some of my applications. So I'm gonna create another one here and I'm just gonna call this dockage. I still don't know if I'm saying that right. Hopefully I am, I've said it in like five videos now. But the apps preset is going to be set. We're gonna save this. And then what you'll see is we have officially created our first nested data set. But the parent of this data set has an access control list. So do you want to modify this at all? You don't have to because we set the preset. So we're just gonna to return to the pool. And at that point, like I said, we have created our first nested data set. So if you wanna create and use applications, I'd suggest that you do that. So if you select apps here, what we're able to do now is search for an app. So we're gonna search for Dockage and we are going to install this. Now, because this is the first application that we are installing, we have to set up a pool to use and I'm just gonna select the pool we created. And now we will be brought to the setup of this application. Now, every application is gonna be different and you can go through and really modify this in any way that you'd like. What I really wanna show you is the storage configuration section. So by default, it's gonna use an IX volume. That's fine, but we're gonna use a host path. And what this is gonna allow us to do is this is gonna allow us to go in and it's going to allow us to access our data set. So what you'll see here is that this is going to be the data set for the stacks. So I'm actually gonna create another data set inside of there and I'm just gonna call this stacks. And then there we go, we have our stacks. I'm gonna do the same for the storage. I'm gonna call it data. And then at that point we have everything set. So by doing it the way we did it, meaning creating a data set and giving it the preset of apps, this all works as expected. If you don't do it that way, you're gonna run into permission issues. You're gonna to have to modify the ACLs. And in my opinion, it's just not the easiest way to do it, but if you want to be my guest. So I'm going to go through and install this now. And what you'll see is that everything installed properly. So the data that we defined in those host paths will now be stored inside of our data set. So rather than an IX volume, we'll know exactly where it is. Now there's obviously a lot that you can do with TrueNAS and you can set up things like replication. And like I said, you should set up backups. But I think that this is good for beginners because it's gonna get you kind of understanding how TrueNAS works, how ZFS works, get you a little more comfortable with it. And hopefully this helped you get there, hopefully. But if you have any questions, please feel free to leave those in the comments. If you wanna see that backups video, leave a comment for that as well. I will add that to my list. But if you made it this far, thank you very much for watching. I will see you guys next time.